Okay, so welcome back. I hope everybody had a good lunch. Um, I promised to do some, some online demo, and it seems that my cell phone has less problems with the wireless than my laptop, so I, I use that, and it seems to work. So I will first show a couple of outputs of liquid uh, topology for different kinds of machines, uh, Intel AMD and some secret machine that you will easily identify. So this is Lima, which is um, our uh, next to our next largest machine, apart from our newest one. It's based on Intel Westmere processors. And you see here, liquid topology minus G gives us um, a lot of output, and I will start at the beginning. You see that it tells us that we have an Intel Core Westmere processor with two sockets, six cores per socket, and two threads per core. So in this machine, we have SMT, hyperthreading, whatever you call it, enabled. And we here, again, you have this list of hardware threads, 0 to 24, thread 0. And here you say the core IDs. These are the core IDs that also drop out if you uh, type cat proc CPU info. And you see it's 0, 1, 2, 8, 9, 10. Awkward numbering. Yeah. Okay, it's just what drops out of the kernel. I don't know why. Um, this is the whole table. Again, the sockets. And oh, the rest is not so interesting. Here we have level one cache groups are two virtual cores. So this is one physical core. Physical ID 0 and 12, they share a physical core. These are the two hyper threads belonging to this core. And they share, of course, a level one cache of 32 kilobytes of size. Um, we have 256 kilobytes of level two cache, also shared only among the two virtual cores of a physical core. And then we have 12 megabytes of level three cache shared across the socket. Two NUMA domains, and this is the graphical output. If you want to know more about the caches, you can use the minus C switch. With minus C, you get a little bit more information about the cache organization. Here, level one cache, we see now it's a data cache, eight-way associative. So we have each set has eight entries. If you know what that is, fine. If not, it's not so important. Uh, number of sets 64, cache line size is 64. It's an inclusive cache. And here we have uh, level two cache. It's unified, meaning it's, uh, it's used for uh, data as well as code. Data and code share this, this level of the cache. 512 sets, cache line size 64 bytes. And level three cache, 12 megabytes, 16 way associative, 12,000 sets, 64 bytes cache line size. So that's the most you can get out of liquid topology in terms of cache organization. OK, let's go to a different machine. This is EMI, our current production cluster, very new. It uses Intel Ivy Bridge processors. Oops, you see it's already too large for the screen. Intel Core Ivy Bridge EP processor, 10 cores per socket, two threads per core. So we have 40 threads, 40 hardware threads on this machine already. And this is why the display doesn't quite fit um, here. If I do it like this, you see the complete output. <coughs> so we have here 40 um, threads. Again, the physical cores are also numbered in a way that is the usual way we want it to be. So 0, 1, 2, 3 are consecutive physical cores on the sockets. So that's something you would accept. It's also the standard numbering on Cray systems. So the Cray XC30 also has a constant numbering that doesn't change that uh, has physical cores consecutively numbered. OK. So this is TG020. I'll switch back to the huge font. Oops, no, I don't switch back to the huge font. Uh, still not enough. OK. So here you see um, this is a machine with two sockets. Each socket has eight cores. Um, each core has a 16 kilobyte cache, and two adjacent cores have a common two megabyte cache. So that's very similar to the example I've shown in the slides. 
This is an um, AMD Interlagos system, two socket Interlagos, very similar to a Cray XE6. Yeah. Uh, but as a standard commodity, commodity type node. And now, can imagine what this is. Um, I, I can't set the font to a size which makes it possible to display the complete ASCII art output on the width of the terminal window. Um, probably we have to scroll up a little bit. Thread cache topology you see here, we have cache groups of size four hardware threads, 32 kilobyte level one cache, four hardware threads, one, two, three, four, share a cache level. Um, and we have 60 of those. This is the thread list, quite long. It goes from zero to 240. And those of you who have ever fought against the Intel Xeon Phi know that this is a Xeon Phi. It has 240 hardware threads on 60 physical cores. Each core has four, um, four hardware threads. And you see there's a, a little detail. Hardware thread zero is thread number zero on core number 59. So the physical numbering in this machine is rotated by one so that the hardware thread zero is on the last core in the machine. This is because some operating system stuff runs on core zero and they move it out of the way. It, get, it, it gets run on the last core in the system. So if you do physical pinning using liquid pin and you start with core number zero, thread number zero with logical, uh, sorry, if you do logical pinning, then you avoid this operating system thread. So it's a very good thing uh, that they did that. Unfortunately, we can't really show uh, the graphical output. Okay. Let's go back to ME. So I've prepared uh, a little benchmark. It's the standard stream benchmark uh, that's used to measure the memory bandwidth of a system. We mentioned this several times. And um, I will now run the stream benchmark in different variants um, on one and two sockets of this Ivy Bridge, Intel Ivy Bridge system. Um, so to remind you, we have two sockets, 10 cores in each socket. Each core has two, uh, two virtual cores. So it's a two-way SMT system. So we say a liquid pin, minus C. And um, for starters, we want to run one thread on this machine. So you say n colon zero. That means our uh, core list only contains a single core, core number zero, in logical numbering across the machine. So n zero means number all cores, all physical cores, f uh, consecutively across the machine first. So zero to 19 would be the 20 physical cores in the machine. And now I set the mask only to zero, so this is one core. And I run, I run this benchmark, steam omp no exe. And you see, since I'm only running a single thread, and I, I haven't set omp num threads explicitly, liquid pin will set it for me. Liquid pin will figure out my core mask only contains a single core. Um, so the omp num threads variable will be set automatically, and the benchmark will only run with a single core a single thread. So this first thread that's being started is pinned to the first core ID in the list. This is core zero. And that's it as far as liquid pin is concerned because no additional threads are being spawned. And the benchmark runs and it gives us this output in case you haven't seen it. These are four loops, four simple benchmark loops. We'll see a little bit more of this tomorrow. Um, copy, scale, add, and try it. Copy is the benchmark we used in the beginning to show you how data travels through the cache hierarchy of a system. So copy just copies one array to another array. And these arrays are large, they're hundreds of megabytes, so it's an out of cache operation. It gets data from main memory and it puts it back to main memory. And it, it reports the visible data transfer rate, 11.4 gigabytes per second. That's the rate that the benchmark sees. How does it calculate that? It does a read and a write so it reads eight bytes, it writes eight bytes, that's 16 bytes per copy, per variable copy. And it knows it has a certain number of copies to make. It measures the time and it gives us the resulting bandwidth. It does not consider any write allocate. It does not know about write allocate. How should it? 
It's a hardware feature. So the bandwidth that the stream benchmark um, prints is the pure user visible program visible bandwidth. And that implies 16 bytes per variable copy, not 24. We know it's actually 24. Yeah? But uh, the, be the, the, the benchmark only sees 16. Um, scale is very similar to copy. It's just reading from an array. Every element of the array is multiplied by a number and then written back to the other array. And add and try it. Add is a, a benchmark that adds two arrays and stores, stores it to the third. And try it reads an array, scales it with a scalar, adds to a second array, and stores it back to a third array. And these get a little bit higher bandwidth. OK, this is for one thread. Now we try to run more threads. Two. Now you see, since we're doing two threads, the compiler generates an additional thread, a shepherd thread. So actually, three threads are running. But only two of them um, execute my code. And Liquid Pin knows that because it knows that this was an Intel compiled binary. So it skips the first generated thread, which is the shepherd thread. And only the third thread, so the second one that's actually generated, gets pinned to core number one, which is the second core in the list. And you see, before, I had about 11.4 gigabytes per second for copy. Now I have over 20, almost perfect scaling. When I go from one to two threads, I get very good scaling on this machine. Three threads, 25 gigabytes per second. Four threads, 27. Now we're getting somewhere close to saturation. It doesn't scale perfectly anymore. Five threads. 27. So it sort of saturates at five threads. The add and try it benchmarks get a little bit more, 31 instead of 27. Can you imagine why that is? It, it's homework. Think about it until tomorrow. Okay. So we see in this machine we can saturate the memory bandwidth using such simple benchmarks with four or five threads. Okay. Now if I want to run let's say, the perfect code, the perfect way of running a bandwidth-bound code on this machine. Um, right now, I'm only using the left socket. So cores 0 to 4 on the left socket. The right socket was idle. If I want to include the right socket, I could do it like that. I could say 0 to 4. And I know the, the, the second socket starts at core ID number 10. So I could say 10 to 14. Because across the node, I get physical cores first across all sockets. So 0 to 4 are the first five cores on the first socket, and 10 to 14 are the first five cores on the second socket. So now I run 10 threads, and I get roughly double the bandwidth. OK, that's fine. I'm using two sockets, so I get twice the bandwidth. Now, this is a little bit awkward to use, not quite intuitive, so I could do it different team. You can write it like this. S0, 0 to 4, first four physical cores in the first socket. S1, 0 to 4, the first four physical cores in the second socket. And it's exactly the same, uh, the same effect. Uh, I get physical ID 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And if I now want to add the corresponding virtual cores, hyperthreads. So probably I assume that I could get a little bit more bandwidth if I use the second um, hyperthread on the core. I can do that. For example, on socket 0, 0 to 9 are the physical cores, and 11 to 19 are the virtual cores that correspond to the first. So I would say 10 to 14. Oops. So this way, I would run a set of 10 threads on the left socket on the first five cores using all the available virtual threads, and the same on the second socket. Yeah. The five, I use the first five cores. The second set of five cores is unused, it's idle, but I use all the available hyperthreads. And you see here, I got a bandwidth of, depending on the benchmark, between 55 and 62 gigabytes per second. 
doesn't change. Okay? So hyperthreading doesn't help me in this uh, benchmark. We'll see tomorrow why that is and how we can explain this and, and, and um, why it should be in the, that way in this case. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to show in terms of liquid pin. And we can now go on with the lecture. Okay. So up to now, we've mostly been dealing with um, computer architecture and a little, a little bit of modeling, although the modeling part will be um, the topic of the next lecture. Um, I told you in the, in the part about performance engineering that our performance engineering process contains a very important component, and this is kernel benchmarking or micro benchmarking. It is for fathoming the capabilities of the machine using simple compute kernels. Kernels that are so simple that you can understand their behavior 100%. And so you learn a lot by, by running simple loop kernels, you learn a lot about the architecture that you can then reuse for um, studying your real applications, your real loops. And that's what we call micro benchmarking for architectural exploration. We explore the architecture, the hardware, by using simple benchmark codes. Um, and to show you what we're dealing with here, um, this is a, a picture from our book. It's already four years old, but it's still surprisingly still valid. Um, this is a diagram of latency and bandwidth in modern computer environments. So latency always assumes you have a data path, and when you want to transfer data across that data path, it takes some time to set up this transfer. Yeah. Compare that with surfing the web, you click on a link, and it takes some time until the data flows, until the data starts flowing. And this latency, this lag, until the data, the bytes start flowing, is the latency. The time it takes to set up a transfer. So for different kinds of um, data transfer channels or data paths we see here, we see the latency on the left scale, in log scale, and the bandwidth on the right scale. The bandwidth tells us how many bytes per second we can transfer per second at most after the initial latency has passed. Okay, so we see the little one cache. That's probably the, the closest you can get to the CPU in terms of data transfer, apart from registers, but registers doesn't cost you anything. It, if you have a data item in the register, you can just access it. It doesn't cost any additional um, um, time. But if it's another one cache, we have already a cost. And in terms of latency, that's of the order of nanoseconds. So modern caches have latencies of three or four cycles. I think it's four cycles in the current Intel processes. And the bandwidth is of the order of hundreds of gigabytes per second. We investigate this a little bit more uh, in a later lecture. Um, now that's for the L1 cache. For the L2 and the L3 cache, the available bandwidth, the theoretical bandwidth that the cache is, is, is able to, to deliver is very similar to the L1 cache in many cases. So uh, probably up to, up to the Nehalem processors and, and Westmi processors, the bandwidth of the L2 and L3 cache were identical to the bandwidth of the L1 cache. So very high bandwidth also for L2. The latency is a little bit larger on the order of 10 to 20 cycles. Main memory has much larger latencies, about 100 cycles nowadays if the memory controller is uh, on the chip, as it is today in modern commodity processors, and the bandwidth is of the order of tens of gigabytes per second. So for a, if, you, if you buy the hottest Intel processor you can buy today for server environments, um, Intel Ivy Town, I think you get like 70 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Uh, in our cluster, it's like 40. And if you buy a mobile laptop processor, it's of the order of 10 to 20, probably, or even less. And then we leave the node, and we have the HPC network, latencies of microseconds, and bandwidths of several gigabytes per second. And of course, high performance computing plays in this regime. Okay? You don't want to use any data path that's beyond that. <clears throat> and that's actually, this picture is important because it tells us what orders of magnitude we can gain when we avoid slow data paths. Actually, this is the, the guideline, the guiding principle for optimizations. Avoiding data paths, which are slow, 
is the key to most performance optimizations. Whatever you do, if you can make sure that slow data paths are avoided, you do something good for the performance of your code. How much it will improve, that depends, okay? We will try to tell you how to estimate that, but uh, this is really the, the key optimization. Avoid slow data paths. There are others, but this is one important thing. You've seen this before, um, and in, in view of this rule, avoiding slow data paths, we will highlight one feature that's available in modern processors here. So the left-hand side is what you know from the beginning. Gerhard has shown this to you. What happens if you copy one array to the next? <coughs> so A equals C, element by element. You load C, every load on a new cache line is a cache miss. You get the cache line, get the element in the register, you store it, have a store miss. The store miss incurs a write all allocate because you can only talk to the cache and you can only transfer data in full cache line packets so that it inevitably leads to the, to the effect that if you store something and there's a store miss, you have to read it first. Then you can modify it in the cache, you can modify the rest of the cache line in cache, and then you get the next cache line in and so on. And at some point later, you have to evict the cache line to update the content of the main memory. Um, now we see that in this case, if you want to estimate the performance of this operation, it's clear the performance of this operation is dominated by the data transfers. Okay, just have to believe me, it is, the, it is that way. And we see that the data transfer is for each element that we copy here, and each element is probably eight bytes, so we need to read eight bytes, we need to write allocate eight bytes, and we need to write eight bytes. So it's 24 bytes for every element that we copy. For every eight byte element that we copy from, a to C, from C to A, we pay a memory traffic of 24 bytes. If we could somehow work around that write allocate, if we could avoid it, <coughs> then we would save one third of the traffic. And if that's our bottleneck, we could predict that we get 50% more performance. So if there, if there were a way to avoid the write allocate, you could boost the performance of this operation by 50%, almost for free, if you knew how to do it. Now it turns out on Intel and AMD processors, there is a way to do this. And this way is called non-temporal stores. Non-temporal stores are special store instructions. These are assembly instructions. The compiler or you, somebody has to employ them. And the non-temporal stores can write around the cache. So they write directly to memory. At least that's the effect that you see. So the write allocate is effectively um, eliminated. As far as the load is concerned, everything is as usual. So you load something, there's a load miss, cache line transfer, and you load it to register. And then, you employ not a normal store, like on the left-hand side, but a, right, uh, a non-temporal store, special instruction. And this tells the architecture, I don't want to store into the cache, I want to talk to memory directly. So what I told you before, that the core cannot talk to the memory directly is not quite true. Um, it can, if you use non-temporal stores. It turns out that if you want to use non-temporal stores effectively, you have to use them in a very specific manner. Especially, we have to use many non-temporal stores in succession, and they must have a stride one access pattern. So you must store consecutively. If you don't do that, performance goes into the basement, as we say. So um, this is because the non-temporal store does not actually write to memory. It writes to a very small cache, which is just a single cache line, which then gets evicted to memory. But it has the effect that the write allocate is not necessary. And of course, then, for each 8-byte element that you copy, you only have two cache line or two elements uh, going over the bus, so you go down from 24 to 16 bytes per copy. And that gives you a predicted performance boost of 50%. That's fine. Only by exchanging your standard store instruction by the non-temporal store. And it works. You can show that it works. You can, in simple cases, like in the stream benchmarks, if the, if the compiler, if the Intel compiler sees the stream benchmark, it knows, aha, stream, fine, <laughs> let's do non-temporal stores. And you can save, you can get 50% performance for almost free. Of course, that assumes that I can utilize the same effective bandwidth over the memory bus here and here. That's true for some processors, for some it's not quite true, but it's true on average. 
So that's one example, one very simple example where we can use a specific hardware feature to reduce the traffic across a slow data path. Here, the slow data path is my memory bandwidth. We avoid some of the traffic so we get a boost. Okay, let's uh, do this in a little bit more structured way. The stream, the stream benchmarks are, uh, um, are made for memory bandwidth measurements, but memory bandwidth is not the only bottleneck that we have, of course. There are many others, especially the, uh, the cache levels. They also have data paths between them, and you want to know how fast are they, and how fast is the execution capability in the core, and so on. So we want to know more about the architecture. And what we use for this kind of investigation is usually the, um, what we call Swiss Army Knife for microbenchmarking. It's the Schönauer Vector Triad. It's called Schönauer Triad because really Schönauer has, has used it first to benchmark um, vector systems in the 80s. Um, it's a very simple core, uh, uh, kernel. This is the red one. So the red code is the actual benchmarking loop. We have four arrays, A, B, C, D, double precision. N is the length. And this N could be large, it could be small. So we can tune it as opposed to the stream benchmark, which has a specific size. We here, we, we specifically leave it open how large n is. It could be very small, it could be very large. OK, and we use these arrays to do some very simple stuff. We, call, we, we read C and D, multiply them, add B, and store it back to A. So for every multiply add operation, we have to read three elements and write A four elements. So we have at least 32 bytes of traffic for every multiply and add not counting any write allocate stuff that's going on. OK. Now, of course, if, this, if these are long arrays, we don't have a problem. So if A, B, C, and D are gigabytes, it takes fractions of a second to execute this loop. So we can just time it and get the performance. That's fine. But if the length is very small, like only a couple of hundreds, then the data is in level one cache. And then this loop is so fast, there's no way to measure it, to measure its time accurately. So what we do is we put a benchmarking loop around it, this J loop, and we choose the iteration and iter of this J loop so that the benchmark runs long enough, long enough for being uh, timed accurately, so at least 100 milliseconds or something. So they can use a normal timing function, get time of day or whatever, to measure the time accurately. So we repeat it many, many times. Because what we want to do is, depending on n, the data resides in different levels of the cache. If n is very large, it's in memory. If n is very small, it's in level one cache. And if it's n is intermediate, it's in level three or level two cache. So by tuning n from very small to very large, we can fathom the data transfer capabilities of this machine that we're running it on. Now, there's a little problem. If you only do the red benchmarking loop and the blue repeat loop, and you give this to a modern compiler, the performance would be really, really good. Really good. I mean, teraflops, more. And the, p the point is that the compiler, of course, sees that you're doing n iter times the same thing. It sees that you, you, you're calculating n iter times the same results, b plus c times d, and you store it to a again and again. That's redundant work. And as it turns out, compilers are sometimes very stupid, but there's one thing they're good at, and that's avoiding useless work. And that's what they do. So the compiler will probably interchange the two loops. In the best case, it will just optimize away the outer loop. And then you're left with the inner loop. And if you assume you do the outer loop, but you're actually not, then you get very good performance. No, not realistic performance numbers. So we have to put in something that makes the compiler believe that we're doing something useful to the data. And this is here. So we uh, put in a call to a dummy function. This dummy function is somewhere else, uh, other compilation unit. You could also print A, yeah? just write A. It's the same effect. And of course, we don't want to actually execute the dummy call because that's overhead. So we mask it by a condition that's never true. Of course, the compiler must, be able to, must not be able to prove that this is never true. Yeah? No, because if false will be evaluated on compile time and then. <laughs> Will be the same situation again. So it must be a, uh, what I usually do is I initialize the arrays with positive numbers. So I know that A is always positive. And then I say if middle element of A is smaller than zero, 
do the call. And no compiler finds out that this is not, not true. OK, so this is really um, for fooling the compiler into thinking that we're doing something useful. That happens all the time. So sometimes in benchmarking, we are forced to work around the compiler optimizations in this way. Um, now, there's an if condition, of course. You might think an if is always not so good. But first, it's not in the inner loop. It's in the middle loop. So it's only executed every n iterations. And second, since it's never true, the hardware can always predict it with 100% certainty. So the penalty is very small, if at all. There is any penalty. Sorry, what's the question? If you're, if you're making an access, if you're making a difficult access like something in memory. Um, of course, you shouldn't do something here that's expensive. That's right. Yeah? But if, um, if the data is in level one cache anyway, it doesn't cost anything to access one element of the array. And if it's in memory, you've spent so much time executing this that getting one additional element in also it's no overhead. So in practice, this is the way it works. OK, so what you do in the end, if you have this benchmark, we set n to, from very small to very large, several orders of magnitude to cover all the cache levels. And we choose an iter dynamically so that it doesn't run too long, but we get an accurate time measurement. Why do we choose this benchmark? Because nobody does this in practice. We choose this benchmark because this kernel is limited by data transfer on all architectures. Everything that you can buy runs this benchmark. And if it runs it, it's limited by data transfer. It's never limited by the arithmetic by the multiplier net. No machine can run this benchmark at peak performance even if the data is in level one cache. You will see this in a minute. So it's really a purely data transfer centric benchmark. OK, well, as I said, we run the benchmark for different loop lengths. We report the performance in megaflops per second. And this is the performance on a single core on a three gigahertz Sandy Bridge processor. And we compare two versions. We have an AVX vectorized variant, so SIMD vectorization. And for this simple code, the compiler does a really good job, so it generates perfect code. There's nothing you can do in manual optimization to make it better. And uh, the, the dashed line is a scalar code, so we force the compiler to not use vectorization. There's a switch minus no vec on the Intel compiler, and if you put that on, then you get this performance. Okay, let's first concentrate on the general shape of the, of the curve. Now, first of all, if you didn't know, you could use this benchmark to measure the cache levels, how large they are. So there's a 32 kilobyte level one cache. 32 kilobytes means um, 8,000 elements, uh, four, sorry, 4,069 elements, 4,096 elements. And 4,096 elements divided by four arrays, that's 1,024 elements. So if A, B, C, and D, are 1,024 elements long. They fit into the L1 cache just barely. And that's exactly what we see. There's a breakdown in 1,024. So if we didn't know, if we couldn't look that up, we would now be able to see, to measure, that the level 1 cache is 32 kilobytes on this machine. The level 2 cache is 256 kilobytes. So we get a strong decline in performance here to the level 2 cache. It's slower. You see why that is. Um, so it ends here, and the level 3 cache is 20 megabytes. So since we're only using a single thread, all the 20 megabyte level 3 cache can be used by the single thread. So we have a huge level 3 cache, and then in memory, performance is way down. Okay, so we could measure the, the, how many cache levels there are and how, how large they are. Then the next thing we could look at is performance levels. And without knowing exactly how the performance is, is made on this architecture, we could still um, calculate some interesting metrics. For example, we could calculate the bandwidth that's incurred, that's used by this benchmark in the different cache levels. So for example, in the level one cache, we have eight gigaflops. Eight gigaflops, that's eight billion flops per second. That's four billion iterations per second because we have two flops per iteration. So four times 10 to the 9 iterations per second. Each iteration consists of three loads and one store. 
that's a 32-byte traffic. Okay, three loads, three times eight bytes, and one store, that's not another eight bytes, so 32 bytes. So we have 32 bytes per iteration times four giga iterations per second, that's 128 gigabytes per second. So we're using the L1 cache with a bandwidth of 128 gigabytes per second. This is not the highest possible bandwidth you can get from the L1 cache. We'll see why later. But it's the highest possible bandwidth you can get on this machine with this benchmark. On the other end of the spectrum, we have main memory. The measured performance is about 900 megaflops, 450 mega iterations per second, times now five words, 40 bytes, because we have the right allocate. In the L1 cache, we don't have a right allocate because there's no right miss. And if the data is in L1 cache, if you read and write from the L1 cache, there's never a cache miss. Especially there's no write miss. If there's no write miss, there's no write allocate. So we only have 32 bytes per iteration up here, but we have 40 bytes per iteration up here because there's a cache between the core and the memory. So we need to count five words. And that, here we end up with 18 gigabytes per second. So this, on this machine, one core using this benchmark can draw 18 gigabytes per second out of the memory. That's an interesting number, okay? And then, of course, we could do the same calculation in between. For any cache level beyond the L1 cache, you would have to count 40 bytes per iteration. Okay. Already some interesting numbers. Now the questions are, are these performance levels plausible? Can we make sense of that? Does it have to be that way? Is 8 gigaflops really the limit? Or could I do something to the code that makes it even faster? Now remember on this machine, we have a Sandy Bridge core with 3 gigahertz. This machine can execute 8 flops per cycle at most. That would be 24 gigaflops. So the peak performance of the core, of one single core, is 24 gigaflops. But we only get 8 gigaflops. Now, you could assume that there's something wrong. I must be getting better performance on this machine because I only get one third in this code. So that's a question. What about multiple cores? If I run this benchmark with many threads, how does it scale? Uh, does the performance in the cache level scale? How does it scale in memory? That's an important question. Okay, we'll investigate all of this later. Now to get at least a hint of the answers we need to these questions, we need to look a little bit more closer to the, um, to the architecture, the microarchitecture of this, of this um, processor. And all the data that's on this slide can be looked up in the Intel documentation. The best document to look at is the Intel, Intel 64 optimization manual. Now you can find all of this. It's very, very thick. Um, you can find all the architectures down to core two and even further um, in the past. Um, not all architectures are documented equally well. Obviously, they have been written by different people, uh, but the most important stuff is there. Okay, so we, we work our way down um, through the cache levels. So we first look at the registers, and we want to know at which rate can instructions be executed in the registers, and between registers and L1 cache. Now, with AVX, you can read from the docs, that this processor can execute one load instruction and half a store instruction per cycle. So every cycle, we can execute a complete load, 256 bits, 32 bytes, every cycle, in throughput mode. And if you want to do a store of a complete 32-byte register, it takes two cycles. So the store bandwidth is half the load bandwidth between the core and the L1 cache. That's the architectural compromise. Intel knows that usually, in practice, codes tend to be load dominated. On average, all the codes that are running on this world use more loads, more loads than stores. So they don't give us the full store bandwidth, only half of that, that's fine. And then in terms of arithmetic, it can execute one multiply and one add instruction per cycle. So four double precision or eight single precision flops each. We've already mentioned these numbers when we calculated the full performance of a complete chip. Huh? Here they are again. And above all that, we have another limitation. We can execute at most four instructions per cycle. Instructions meaning micro ops. So um, if you ever saw anything about x86 assembly language, you know that there are instructions which combine a load and an add, for example. 
So you can add a register and an operand which is in memory. And these instructions are complex instructions. They are split internally automatically into two micro ops. And we have a limitation of four micro ops per cycle. Okay, that's the relevant bottlenecks with AVX code on the core. If we don't use AVX but SSE, which was the previous generation SIMD instruction set, and only used 128 bits registers, or scalar execution, we have different bottlenecks. So with SSE or scalar, we can execute either two loads per cycle or one load and one store. So this bottleneck is different. We can again execute one mult and one add instruction and have a limit of four microns. Okay, and then about the data transfers, there are buses between the cache levels. Each bus is half duplex, so it can either transfer a cache line up or down, not both at the same time, and the bandwidth is 32 bytes per cycle. So for each cache line, which is 64 bytes, to transfer it between L2 and L1, we take two cycles. And to get it back, when it must be evicted, it takes another two cycles. Same is true for L3. And in main memory, of course, you can look up the main memory bandwidth, but that's not what you get in practice. What you get in practice, at most, is what you get with stream, stream bench, benchmark. So you have some bandwidth. Yeah? For this processor that we use here, it's about 40 gigabytes per second. Okay, so they, these are the architectural features that we need to make more sense of the performance behavior on this machine. And now we can go back to the measurement of the vector triad and try to make sense of the data. So again, this is AVX and scalar code. And I tell you now, the eight gigaflops that we get if the data is in level one cache is exactly the theoretical limit. There's no way you can get more with this benchmark. So it's one third of the peak performance. Now we can calculate that from the information from the last slide. For scalar code, the limit is three gigaflops. Also, cannot be, get, cannot be better if you force it to use scalar code. So the impact of SIMD is a factor of 2.66. It's not a factor of four, which is strange because AVX gives us four wide execution. We can load four elements, we can crunch four elements, we can store four elements, each with a single instruction, but we get only a speed up of 2.66 from scalar to AVX, not a factor of four, that's strange. So why is that? And we can explain that using the data from the previous slide. Okay, so, so bear with me, we will repeat this another time so you have time to, to digest it. We know from the previous slide, the maximum load store throughput on this machine it's one full width load, 32 bytes, and one half width store per cycle, so 16 bytes per cycle store. Which means for eight flops, so if you look at this, and if you think about that every add and every multiply is actually four adds and four multiplies, so you're doing four of those at the same time using two instructions, add and multiply. So these are eight flops. You take three cycles. Why do you take three cycles for eight flops? because you need to load four elements of D, that's one cycle. You can only do one load per cycle. Then four elements of C, that's the second cycle, and four elements for B, that's a third cycle. So it takes you already three cycles to execute the three loads for D, C, and B. And then you have to store A, that's a 32-byte store, but that takes two cycles. But they can be executed at the same time. They can be overlapped with the loads. Yeah? So this code is limited by the loads. It's completely load dominated. All other pipelines are not quite filled. Load pipeline is full. So we take three cycles because we have three loads in, for eight flops. So eight flops per three cycles. And since we have three gigahertz as a clock frequency, and we do eight flops per three cycles, three cycles is one nanosecond, eight flops in one nanosecond is eight gigaflops. That's why this code runs on this processor with eight gigaflops. And the bottleneck is the load pipeline. The load pipeline is 100% filled. The store pipeline is not 100% filled because we have one free slot, and the add and multiply pipelines there, they're, they're bored, <laughs> okay? Okay, what about the scalar limit? Why is it not a factor of four? Because if the load pipe is the limit here, 
and the load is four times parallel, and I only do a scalar load, why is, not a, why is it not a factor of four? Okay, let's do the math. In scalar execution, I can do two loads, or one load and one store per cycle. So I can do two loads, C and D, at the same cycle, and I can do the load for B and the store for A in the same cycle. So it takes me two cycles for two flops, scalar. Two cycles for two flops, and that's exactly as many flops per second as I have cycles per second, three gigaflops. The reason is that the bottle, different bottlenecks apply. Yeah? Here, I can do one full width load and half a store, and here I do two loads or one load and one store. That's a different bottleneck. Yeah, this, uh, this is a design decision that's been made. We could elaborate on this, but just accept it as it is. And this is why we don't have a factor of four, because we can do two loads at the same time in certain situations, if there's no store that we have to do at the same time. So in, in scalar mode, if you want to put it that way, the execution of this code in scalar mode is in a way more efficient than with AVX. Okay, so we've made sense of this. We can now explain why it is three gigaflops in scalar and eight gigaflops in vector mode. What's a little bit disappointing is that although we have this almost three X speed up for AVX in the level one cache, if we go to level two, it's 15%. And in level three, it's less than 10%. And in memory, it's not visible at all. So um, if you have a code that is using data from main memory heavily, and you go to great lengths vectorizing it, the expectation is that you don't, get, don't see much benefit. This is because SIMD vectorization is a pure in-core feature. It increases the data throughput and arithmetic throughput on the core level. But if the overhead, if the bottleneck is somewhere else, like getting data from main memory, then all the speed up in the core doesn't get you anything. Yeah. That's a very important realization. So SIMD is an in-core optimization. The far, farther away the data is from the core, the smaller the SIMD impact. Of course, you could potentially have a very large data set, but use it in a way so that the bottleneck is in the core. Typical example is matrix matrix multiplication. If you use matrix matrix multiply on gigabyte matrices, you use a well-optimized library, you get almost peak performance. Although the memory footprint is gigabytes. Now that's because this loop matrix matrix multiply can be optimized so that the bottleneck is here. And then you get the full AVX benefit. But not if the data has to come from memory. This is wasted effort. To, to optimize this code for SIMD vectorization is wasted effort, if this were the code you had to execute for your, for your program. Okay, so we see more about this, and we also have, we show you a way tomorrow to predict these breakdowns. Why exactly do we have three gigaflops here on the level two cache, and why do we have two gigaflops here on the level three cache? That can be predicted. Takes a little bit more uh, advanced modeling. Now, um, this is exactly what I've been talking about. <laughs> if you take the theoretical limits, and I've shown you in this slide, we have 32 bytes per cycle on the L2 cache and the L3 cache. If you know these limits, we can calculate how fast this code should run in the L2 and L3 caches. If you put this in, you can calculate if you could fully utilize this 32 bytes per cycle bandwidth, it should run with five gigaflops but we only get three. In level three cache, we only get less than two. So that's not so good. That means that there is a bottleneck, data transfer from the L3 cache. The bottleneck tells us we should get five gigaflops, but in practice, we only get 1.8. And this has huge consequences. This is a breakdown of a simple model that we make for execution, and it requires a, a more advanced modeling. That's why we say, huge consequences because that's the topic of ECM modeling which we will deal with tomorrow in the last lecture. So keep that in mind. The simple bandwidth modeling doesn't really work for intermediate cache levels and also not for main memory. If you take the memory bandwidth as a limitation, it should be here, but you get less than half of the predicted performance. 
Okay, just to keep in mind that this is something we have to deal with. Okay. Now this was for a single core. Everything we did up to now was for a single core execution. We've sort of made sense of that. There were some open questions, but uh, this is fine. The next thing we could try is we could put more pressure on the architecture by using this benchmark and put it on several cores. Not in order to parallelize it, so it's not a real work sharing parallelism. It's more like a, a, a throughput mode. So what we do, we still have this benchmark kernel. We still have the repeat loop in ITER around it. And on the outside, we have an OMP parallel directive. So every single thread and every single core that we run them on executes the same benchmark, the same length. There's no work sharing. If we, if we, would, uh, if we wanted to have work sharing, you would have to put an OMP do in front of the red loop. But we don't. This is pure throughput, pure hardware probing. No work sharing intended. And the good thing about this is there's also no overhead, no extra overhead. Of course, we have to start the threads here, and we have to end the threads here. That is overhead, but the timing is inside that. So we don't care about the OpenMP overhead. We use OpenMP as a pure, as a vehicle to, to um, run our benchmark in throughput mode. And then, again, we do the, the scaling of n. So we tune n from very small to very large and we uh, scale the number of threads and see what happens. Okay, so this is a throughput oriented benchmark. This is again performance versus loop length for four cases, one thread, two, four, and eight threads on a socket. And the, the colors in the, in the graph correspond to the colors of those dots on the right hand side. So the black dot corresponds to the black line and this is the performance graph we had in before. It's just compressed because we have, uh, we scale up to eight threads. Okay, so the black line is exactly the original data with a single thread. The red line is with two threads, the green with four, the blue with eight on the socket. And so we see, if you look into L1 cache, there's perfect scaling. And that's what we expect from the topology, because every core has its own level one cache. There's no other core demanding anything from this cache, so it should scale, and it does. Now we get eight gigaflops for a single thread, and 64 for eight threads. Perfect, as expected. Level two cache, same situation. We get four times and eight times the performance uh, than a single thread with four and eight threads, so it scales perfectly. Also, this is to, to be expected because each core has its own private L2 cache. There's no resource sharing, no potential bottleneck. On the L3 cache, we're not quite sure. We wouldn't know if we didn't know the architecture very intimately, um, we couldn't predict what happens because L3 cache is a shared resource. Potentially, this is a bottleneck because everybody has to get data from the L3 cache. But we see, if you look at, at the data, the bandwidth in the L3 cache also scales perfectly. If you look exactly, there's a speed up of 7.5 with eight threads. Okay, that's almost perfect, okay? So we have scalable bandwidth in the L2, L1, L2, and L3 cache. For L1 and L2, that's entirely plausible. For L3, that shouldn't be taken for granted. If you did the same test on an Intel Westmere processor, so the previous, previous generation, no, the previous generation, you would see a saturation behavior here. So the L3 cache on this Westmere does not scale, but on the Sandy Bridge it does. This is because of the specific cache design for the Sandy Bridge processor, so every core has its own section of the L3 cache and it's actually scalable, but still every core can use the complete cache. So it's very, very ingenious. And then we drop out to main memory and then it becomes interesting because main memory is on this machine the only potential bottleneck now. Now this is a little bit compressed here, so we have enlarged the section. So black again is one thread, red is two, uh, red is two green is four, and eight is blue. And we see from one to two threads, we get a decent speed up. It's not quite a factor of two, but almost. And then with four threads, we saturate it because from four to eight, there's no additional speed up. So again, we see we recover the saturation behavior. We have a benchmark that relies heavily on data transfer. It's limited extremely by data transfers. And it saturates with, if, if you do the intermediate steps as well, it's at three threads is saturated. After three threads, nothing changes anymore. Okay, so we have a strong saturation effect in memory on this machine. And this is the behavior 
of the data paths on this machine. Everything up to L3 is scalable. Beyond L3, we have the typical saturation behavior. And to put it the other way around, with a single thread, even with this highly data-dependent benchmark, it's not possible to saturate the full memory bandwidth. You cannot write a program on this machine that gets the full data bandwidth with a single thread. It's not possible. This is valid for all modern server processors. For desktop variants, like four core in your laptops, in your desktops, this is not quite true. Sometimes there are some variants of processors that can get the full performance of the main memory with a single thread, but not the typical server variants we have in high performance systems. Okay, now let's investigate this a little bit more. What we could do is we could choose a large data set here, tens of, tens of megabytes or gigabytes, and we can make a cut through these lines so it's to see how the performance, how the bandwidth saturates if we scale up the number of threads. Uh, by the way, why does the blue line drop earlier than the red and the, and the green line and the black line? Any explanation? Because here, we have, to, we have to drop at the same point, 1,024. Also for the L2 cache, at the same point, about 10,000. But here, the more threads I use, the earlier the breakdown. Why? Okay? The, the L3 cache is shared. So if I run only a single thread, I have the full 20 megabytes. If I run two threads, I only have 10 megabytes per thread. And if I run four, I only have five megabytes. So the more threads I run, the less, thread, the less cache is available per thread. So I get an earlier breakdown. It's a simple sharing effect. Size sharing, not bandwidth sharing. Okay, so as I said, I, I promised um, this is scaling behavior in main memory for three interesting processors, AMD Interlagos in green, Sandy Bridge circles, and the squares is Westmere, the previous generation. And we see that none of these can saturate the bandwidth with a single thread. You always need at least a couple of threads to saturate the bandwidth, first observation. Second, the Westmere seems to be the most bandwidth-starved processor of these three because only two threads are sufficient to saturate, and then from three to six threads, nothing happens anymore. So this is really a bandwidth-starved processor. I can almost reach the limit with a single thread. I need two to get the limit, but then it's flat. What do you think? Um, if I had a processor which could get the full bandwidth with a single thread, would that be good or bad? Is it a quality, a sign of quality, if you can get the full bandwidth with a single thread? Or is it inferior? Because this is not a scalable graph. Yeah? This is not scalable. So uh, as, a, as a vendor, as a marketing guy, I would say this doesn't look good. Yeah. It's not scalable. My processor doesn't scale. It's rubbish. But as a scientist who wants to run simulation tasks on these processors, I would wish for a processor that can use the full bandwidth with a single thread. Because I can run, if my, my, my code is memory bound, bandwidth bound, it's sufficient to run a single thread. I can leave the others idle, save some power. I can get away with less threads, fewer threads, fewer MPI processes, and get the full performance. That's a good thing. So for me, it's a good thing if I use only a few threads, if I have to use only a few threads to get the full bandwidth. A scalable processor where I need eight threads to get the full bandwidth, that's boring. I need a lot of parallelism to get to the bottleneck. The less, less parallelism I need to get to the relevant bottleneck, the better. Okay, and so in my opinion, in this respect, Westme was the best of the three. Of course, you can put it the other way around. It has so, such, a, such a bad bandwidth that um, I can reach it almost with one thread. Okay. Um, the Sandy Bridge is much faster in memory, almost a factor of two faster in saturation bandwidth. And it's also faster on a single thread, but not much. So I need three threads to saturate. And on the Interlagos, I need four. It depends a little bit on the Interlagos where I place those threads. So here, these four were placed on two modules. If you place the four threads on four modules, you saturate a little earlier. Okay. Now, on Interlagos, 
You know from the beginning in the first slides, we showed you that the Lagos processor has one socket with two chips. Each chip has its own memory interface. And you see this here. This is one NUMA domain, eight cores. But if I buy an Interlagos processor, I get two NUMA domains for the same price as a Sandy Bridge. So if I scale across the second NUMA domain as well, I get good performance, almost the same as on Sandy Bridge. But I have two chips. But that's fine. I mean, it's, it's what I buy in the shop. One, one, one processor package gives me that performance level. But at the price of having two NUMA domains. So this is the bottleneck of main memory. I said that L3 cache is usually shared. So that's another potential bottleneck. Oh, that's the next slide. Sorry. Um, bear with me. <laughs> so here's a comparison of memory bandwidth saturation behavior for different, four different processors. Intel Sandy Bridge. You've seen this data before. AMD Interlagos. Xeon Phi, 60 threads or 60 cores. And NVIDIA K20. See, for Sandy Bridge, we need three threads or probably four to saturate. On Interlagos, we have this strange behavior again. So we saturate inside a NUMA domain, and then across the second domain, we have linear scaling. You see an echo of this, of this module concept here, yeah? these little bends. This is the modules that we um, fill gradually. On the Xeon Phi, even with such a very highly um, bandwidth demanding benchmark, we don't really see a saturation. Yeah, we see some, it levels off a little bit, but there's no strong saturation pattern. We almost there at 50 threads, but it's no strong saturation. And on NVIDIA, well, um, it's hard to say what to compare here, but this is the number of threads we use on this machine. And you see, if you use 10,000 threads, you get about 140 gigabytes per second, and this is saturation. Yeah. So you need 10,000 threads to get there. So the amount of parallelism that you need to saturate the memory interface of an NVIDIA graphics card is much higher than on all these. That's what you have to keep in mind. Yeah? You need more parallelism to get to the relevant bottleneck. So for 1,000 threads, for example, you only get half of the bandwidth, roughly. So for comparison, a two-socket Sandy Bridge node is here. Yeah? That's what Gerhard told in the, in the morning. You can expect, if your memory bandwidth bound, a speed up of two, comparing a Xeon Phi or a New Decade 20 with a two socket modern CPU node. OK. As I said, the level three cache is another shared resource, so there's a potential bottleneck. And again, we compare in Alagos and Sandy Bridge and Westmere. So on Westmere, sorry, on Westmere, we have the saturation pattern. So in L3 cache, we need three threads, and then it's done. So the L3 cache is a strong bottleneck on Westmere. If you have a bandwidth-bound algorithm, even if your code, if, even if your data set is in level 3 cache, there is a bottleneck. You see it here. On the Sandy Bridge, they've changed the cache design. Every core has its own section of the cache, and it's scalable. The more cores they put in, the more cache bandwidth there is. And you get a really a huge bandwidth here, 300 gigabytes per second in this machine for the L3 cache. Very scalable design. On AMD, I mean, the level three cache is smaller than the L2 cache in this machine. That's the first thing. And second, it's very slow. So the, the, the L3 cache on the Interlagos is really not, not something you would optimize for. It's not a target cache for optimization. If you want to optimize your code to make better use, better data reuse from the cache, the L3 cache is not the target cache on Interlagos. The actual target cache is the L2 cache. That's what we see here, the open symbols. That's the performance scaling if we put the data in L2 cache. Of course, the L2 cache is not a shared cache. It's shared by two adjacent cores in a module, but not across the complete chip. But if you use the L2 cache as a target, again, you get almost the same performance as on Sandy Bridge. So from the bare numbers, they are equivalent. OK, so in the L3 cache on the Interlagos is a victim cache. It's more for synchronization and other purposes. It's not something you would optimize for. Now, with all these saturation patterns going on, this has important consequences for benchmarking and for profiling. And um, so this is the typical patterns we distinguish on the node level. We have a saturating type, and we have a scalable type. So if you, if you look at a loop in your code, and you want to understand its performance behavior, the first thing you can do 
short from really looking into it, what, is, what does it do, doing a model and so on, you could measure the performance scaling behavior across the course of a chip. Of course, you have to assume, uh, make some assumptions. You have to assume there's no load imbalance, no, no trivial stuff going on. So we assume we can utilize all the processes effectively. And then you get either one of those patterns. Either you have the saturating type, which means you hit a bottleneck at a certain number of cores, or you get the scalable type, which means there's no other bottleneck. You have or only use core private resources and their performance scales. And if you had more cores, you would get more performance linearly. So these are the two possible patterns if there are no other um, performance limiting aspects apply. Now let's assume we have an application which you run with a single thread. And half of the runtime is spent in a saturating part, like a matrix vector multiplication or a vector triad, yeah, something that saturates performance. And the other half of the runtime is spent in a scalable part, like matrix matrix multiply or very complicated arithmetic, which is core only, core bound, no other bottlenecks. And you do your profile of your application based on the single thread run. Okay, so you see 50% is spent here, and 50% is spent here. Now both parts would be subject to optimization efforts. However, if you run this on a full socket with eight threads, then due to the saturating part being saturating, you see that the saturating part only gets a speed up of three or so, and the scalable part gets the full speed up of eight. So in the parallel case with eight threads, suddenly 80% of the time is spent with the blue part, and only 20% is spent with the yellow part. Now it's clear what the optimization target is. You should first care about the blue part. Yeah. So the, the non-scalable part, the saturating part, is the optimization target. Do something for this part first and then care about the second one. So this saturation behavior is important. It's not just um, that you can stop scaling here and leave the rest of the course idle. It's also about finding the optimization target. And the profile of the application could shift significantly when you scale across the course of a chip. That's, you have to keep that in mind. OK. So much for the hardware probing. So we have used the, um, the vector try to probe certain elements of the architecture and to find out some bottlenecks. Um, the next question is, what happens if I do true work sharing? If I write the OMP do in front of the actual benchmarking group? So now I divide the, the work across the available threads and cores and see what happens. Now, if there weren't any overhead from the programming model, if there weren't any OpenMP overhead for creating threads and synchronizing and so on, we would expect a very similar behavior to before that we did the throughput because we run the same kind of code on the complete machine, multi-threaded, so the same bottlenecks apply. Okay, we would expect similar behavior, probably a little bit different in terms of when breakdowns occur because now I have work sharing, so sizes of areas are different, but the general behavior should be similar. So now we have a parallel directive on the outside. So the benchmarking loop is in the parallel directive already, and the work sharing occurs on the red level. This is what happens. So here we, with one thread, sorry, yeah. With one thread, we have the black data. And you see the level one core limit of eight gigaflops is, is shown here. And you don't even get it, yeah? even with a full level one cache you haven't reached this level one core limit. There are still about 40% missing. Strange. Because, okay, this is an OpenMP code, but I'm running it with a single thread only. So why is it so far from the theoretical limit? Beyond the L1 cache, everything is fine. That's the usual behavior we expect. So it seems that even with a single thread and OpenMP turned on in this OpenMP construct in the code, we have some penalty for OpenMP. And what's even more striking, if you go from one thread to eight, so the full socket, the code gets slower whenever we are below about a 1,000 loop length. So the, you put, put in more resources, and the performance goes way down. And then if you put in the full, full machine, two sockets, the performance goes down even further. So the more resources you put in, the slower you get. 
that's a bad thing, but of course, the, the consequence or the, the reason is clear. What we have here is uh, the consequence of the synchronization overhead. At the end of each OpenMP loop, if you don't prevent it, we have an implicit barrier. Now, this implicit barrier has some cost, costs some cycles. We will show you later how many cycles it costs with modern compilers. And if the cost of this barrier is comparable to the cost of the computation, we have a performance penalty that can be seen, can be measured. And obviously, the cost of the barrier is larger than the cost of the computation in this region. And we also see if we put in more threads, obviously the cost of the barrier gets higher and higher. So the cost of the barrier scales with the number of threads. Bad, bad news. And this is actually the reason for many OpenMP codes not working or not scaling properly, because people write OpenMP work sharing directives where they actually shouldn't. Yeah. On the other hand, if you, now, if you have enough work to do, like in the L3 cache, we get good scaling again. But you see, with 16 threads on two sockets, there's even an echo from the overhead, even if you are in L3 cache. I mean, this is a data set of 40 megabytes here. Here's probably 10 megabytes. So a huge data set. And see, still we see some echo of the synchronization overhead. So this has a consequence. If we go to very large data sets, when the overhead is negligible, because the running the benchmark takes seconds, then we see we have good scalability. So going from eight threads, from red to green, we get a speed up of two, because we go from one socket to two sockets. Perfect, as expected. Good scalability across memory interfaces. OK, now let's get back to this situation here. Now one message is, even if you use a single thread only, you have a penalty from the OpenMP. And the penalty is mostly the barrier. It's the largest part. There are other uh, contributions like kicking off, uh, kicking off the threat team and so on. But the, the, most, the, the highest contribution is the barrier. And we feed it with a single thread already. Um, it grows with the number of threads. So the question is, how many cycles does it cost? Can I measure that? And actually, since you know how fast the code runs from your throughput measurements, you could use this data to derive how expensive the barrier is. You could do that. It's a little bit, a little bit um, tedious to do that, and of course you can measure it directly. And that's what we've done. You can measure synchronization or barrier overhead directly using simple benchmarks. And one benchmark suit that's suitable for that is the Edinburgh Micro Benchmarks Test Suit. Um, we've modified it a little bit to have more data, but we've essentially used that, uh, that benchmark suit. And we've specifically benchmarked the OpenMP barrier for different compilers to see how many cycles does it cost. If I know how many cycles my computation costs because I have a performance model, and if I know how many cycles a barrier costs because I have measured it, then I can judge whether a certain performance behavior is plausible using these two numbers. And what we do is we look at the overhead for the barrier for different situations. For example, when I synchronize two threads, if they are on the same socket, the same cache, on different sockets, even on the same core, what does it cost? Yeah? And different thread counts. Going from two threads to the full domain, what's the extra cost for putting in more threads? By hand. <laughs> if you do it right, you do it in a tree, of course, yeah. So the F3 cache latency is like 20 or 30 cycles. 
So if you assume that every core must access the shared resource once, that's 30 cycles times eight plus some overhead, a couple of hundred cycles for eight cores. So a thousand cycles wasn't a, was not a bad estimate. Yeah? It's not, not bad, you're not far off. If you choose the right compiler, we'll, we'll see in the next slide. So here we have in the first table, the overhead in cycles, CPU cycles for Sandy Bridge AP on running two threads. So we only synchronize two OpenMP threads. And what we vary is the type of compiler and the, the position of the threads. So in the first um, row, we have a shared L3. So running the two threads on two different cores, but on the same L3 cache. So they can synchronize using a variable in the cache. Second row, two threads running on the same core using different virtual cores. And second, two threads running on different sockets. So they have to take the long way across the um, internuma network. So for the Intel compiler, we see synchronizing two threads takes about 400 cycles. That's a little bit more than two times the L3 cache latency. Yeah, so. And it turns out that you can do better. If you only synchronize two threads, you can write your own barrier that's about twice as fast. If, you really have, if that's your problem, you can solve it better than Intel did. Uh, as it turns out, it's very hard to do better than Intel did on the socket level. But on the two-thread level, you can. Now, for the GCC compiler, for seven, 5,000 cycles. Obviously, this is not a main optimization target of the OpenMP guys in GCC. And this hasn't really changed across uh, GCC um, um, optimization uh, uh, variants. We haven't done this test with 4.8, but we might in the next iteration of these slides. Okay, so here, Intel is about a factor of 10 faster than GCC, synchronizing two threads on the same L3 cache. Using two threads on the same core is really expensive. And this has been known for a long time. Um, if you run two threads on the same core, synchronizing them always involves spin weighting over some resource. Yeah, there's some shared variable, even if it's an L1 cache, this means that the resources of the core are, are actually sucked up by a single thread already. And there's a second thread kicking in from time to time, hammering on the same resource, you have a lot of overhead. So this is an effect which has been known for a long time. If you have to synchronize two threads, better make sure that you don't do it across SMT threads. It's even more expensive than placing the two threads as far apart as possible. On the other socket, it only takes 1,400 cycles. For GCC, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's actually a little bit uh, faster if you do it on the SMT threads and just slightly slower if you go to the other socket. So there are other bottlenecks. The actual access time to the shared resource is not important. GCC spends its time somewhere else. We don't know where. Good. Then going from two threads to the full domain, it's interesting to see how it scales. Um, going from two threads to eight threads on a socket, Intel goes up to 1,500 cycles, so it's roughly a factor of four. Um, if you do this, for example, for the Intel Xeon Phi, 60 cores, 240 threads, you can have a nice, nice curve and you see the barrier overhead is actually logarithmic. So they're doing it the right way. There's a tree in there and they know how to do this. On the complete node, it's roughly a factor of two, slower again, so 1, 000, uh, sorry, 3,400 cycles for all 16 cores. And if you include all the SMT cores, it's about 7,000 cycles. For GCC, you end up with something you don't want to see. So um, now the question is, is this good or bad? Is this a high value? It turns out that Intel has a very good implementation, so it's very hard to get there with your own code. Um, we, we couldn't. <laughs> we can only get better on the two-thread case. Um, is 7,000 cycles expensive or is it cheap? Now, of, of course, it depends on what work do you do. How much work do you do until you hit this barrier? If the work that you do takes 700,000 cycles, that's 1% overhead, you don't care. But if the work that you do is just 700 cycles, you do care. And that's what happens here. Yeah. Here you're completely swamped by the, SN, by the uh, synchronization overhead of, in this case, um, 4,000 cycles, and the work only takes a couple of hundred cycles. That's why you have this strong breakdown. Okay, so it's important. I mean, probably even the GCC barrier with 60,000 cycles is not important for you. If you spend a million cycles in between, who cares? You have to know how much time you spent uh, actually computing 
between the barriers. Now we've mentioned Xeon Phi a couple of times now. It's nice to see how the barrier behaves on this machine with the Intel compiler. So um, if, you, if you synchronize threads in a core across the threads of a core, it takes between 1,600 and 4,000 cycles on one core. And if you then use the full chip, all threads, you pay about 18,000 cycles. Okay, 18,000 cycles doesn't look bad. At least it's 240 threads. Now you have to compare that with the 8,000 cycles for two sockets of Sandy Bridge, so it's a little bit more than a factor of two, 2.7. So not bad for this, this huge, this massive processor. However, still you have to compare it with something. And what do you compare it with? Now, we have to make a little bit, uh, we have to do a little bit math to, to judge whether that's expensive or not compared to the Sandy Bridge. So we have 3.75 times more cores on the Phi. So compared to the full Sandy Bridge, node, which has 16, we now have 60, so almost four times more cores. We can do two times more operations per cycle on the on a Phi core, because it can do 16 flops, not just eight, but 16 flops per cycle, each core. And the penalty for the battery is 2.7 times more expensive. Yeah, instead of about 4,000, we have, um, or instead of about 7,000, sorry, we have 18,000. So, on the Xeon Phi, per cycle, broken down to a single cycle, you can do 7.5 times more work, which means on the Xeon Phi, one cycle is much more precious. And if the cycle is so precious, the 18,000 doesn't look so good anymore. Now, if, you, if you scale the pain with that factor, you see that the, the, the impact from the barrier is 20 times higher on the Xeon Phi. Now, it's the 2.7 times the 7.5. So the absolute number of cycles doesn't seem too large, but the pain is 20 times larger. And some people say that's the reason why you shouldn't actually use OpenMP in this naive way on the Xeon Phi, because the barrier is so expensive, not just in absolute numbers, but also in terms of, especially in terms of the pain that you get from the barrier. So people have devised ways of uh, relaxed synchronization, synchronizing only neighboring cores, only cores that actually have to synchronize. Of course. OpenMP doesn't give you any way to do this in the standard, so they do it themselves. It's a very uh, interesting industry going on. How do you synchronize threads on the Xeon Phi? Don't use the barrier with OpenMP, unless you know exactly that this is not a bottleneck. So this is the conclu conclusions from the microbenchmark. You see now how affinity, how sharing of resources affects the performance using these simple benchmarks. Affinity matters. Almost all performance properties depend on where the data is, of course, whether it's in memory, in cache, or in the registers, and whether threads and processes are running. That, uh, and that's valid for the bottlenecks, typical bandwidth bottlenecks, typical performance properties, and also for the uh, synchronization overhead for OpenMP. And similar things apply for MPI. If you run MPI and you communicate point-to-point -point communication between two processes running on a chip, on two chips, on two nodes, you get similar kinds of performance levels. I haven't shown this here. So you have to know where your threads are running, and you have to know where your data is. Okay. And in the best case, you also have to know what's the best, how to impose a, a pinning affinity um, a strategy that gets the most out of the machine. OK. Now, before the break, that's very good. Before the break. Uh, we have a little case study, and we will revisit um, uh, this example several times. Uh, sparse matrix vector multiplication with OpenMP. Whoever, who in this room has dealt with sparse matrix vector multiply in any code? Well, a couple of people, okay, some didn't. So if you, if you have like an FE code or um, large sparse matrices you have to diagonalize, or if you solve a large sparse linear system, you inevitably come across this this kernel, and um, I think it's the, it's, it produces over the years the most papers per line of code. Because it's only five lines of code, probably seven if you take the OpenMP into account. Maybe stencils, yeah, that's a, that's a close competitor. <laughs> yeah, it's the same type of computation. Okay, um, so uh, judged by the size of the code, it's really 
produces a lot of noise. Um, so it's a key ingredient in many algorithms, for example, matrix diagonalization, Lanchas, David, Davidson, Jacobi Davidson. Um, if you have a sparse matrix that you want to multiply with a vector, of course, if the matrix is really sparse, so most entries are zero, we don't want to store all the non-zeros. Uh, sorry, all the zeros. We only want to store the non-zeros. So we have to devise some, some compression scheme that only puts the non-zeros into memory and ignores the zeros. That's the first thing. If we say a sparse matrix, we usually mean that if we increase the problem size, so for example, the number of rows in a physical problem, that would mean increase the number of degrees of freedom, for example, then the number of non-zeros only scales linearly with the number of rows, not quadratically, as would be the case with a um, dense matrix. So we have this operation, which might be very dominant in terms of computing time in your program. Sparse matrix times vector, and we update a target vector with this product. OK, so we start row by row, as we usually do it. And by accessing each element of each row of the matrix in turn, we have to access the corresponding right-hand side element. And even if you could make sure that the access to memory in the matrix rows is good in terms of cache, so you always go through memory with a stride of one, the right-hand side access is potentially bad. So we have some indirect addressing, and depending on the structure of the matrix, this could be really bad. If the matrix is diagonal or stencil-like, so very long, straight diagonals, then the access here to the right-hand side is linear, so you don't care. It's fine. But there are matrices which are really bad, where you access the right-hand side in a very erratic way. So every time you need an element, you get the complete cache line, you use the element, and then the next time you use the cache line, you have to get it again, because it's been evicted. Okay? So this is potentially bad. And um, sometimes people say, this is the main problem. This is why sparse matrix vector is so slow. Now, we have a way to see this in a little bit more um, different way. So it's not always the case that the right-hand side access is bad. We'll see how we can quantify this. OK. How do we store such a matrix? Because we have to compress it. We have to squeeze out, squeeze out all the zeros. And the most popular scheme is compressed row storage, it's also sometimes called compressed sparse row. So the way it works is the following. We have this sparse matrix again. Each entry has a column index and a row index. And what we do first is we take all the non-zeros, we write them consecutively, and we squeeze out all the zeros. Okay? So we write all the non-zeros one after the other without the zeros, and we put them into an array called val. That's the first thing. Of course, now we've eliminated some information. First of all, we haven't memorized where a new row starts. So for example, the first row has four elements. So at the fifth element, a new row starts. So we have to memorize that. i come to that in a minute. And the second thing we have forgotten is where the original column indices were. So for each element of the matrix, we have to memorize the original column index. That's what we have here. So in addition to our values in the matrix, we need to store an array of integers that tell us this is the original column index of the matrix entry that we're dealing with. OK? And then, of course, we have to deal with the, with the rows. So each time a new row starts, we have to memorize the index in the val array where this row starts. So this is potentially a, a, a low memory footprint array. It tells us for each row on which index it starts. This is what we need to store a matrix in CRS format. And this is a good format for standard cache-based market processors. If you run an arbitrary matrix with this format on a standard CPU like Sandy Bridge, you will get reasonable performance, whatever that means. It's not so good for GPUs and Xeon Phi in many cases, but for standard CPUs it is. OK. Here is how we write the matrix vector multiply. If we have uh, put it down in this format, so we have a two-way loop nest. <clears throat> the outer loop is over the rows of the matrix, 1 to nr. And the inner loop is over one row. So j goes from row pointer of i to row pointer i plus 1 minus 1. That's exactly the indices that, that span one row. So j can be used now in the column index array to get the column index of the required right-hand side element, the b vector. Val of j is the matrix entry. And C of i is the left-hand side element to be updated. So the blue loop is the inner loop across one row. 
and the outer loop goes over the, the rows. And now, of course, this is very easy to parallelize since we're writing to C of i, and we can parallelize the i loop, so we just write OMP parallel do, and we're done. Very easy to parallelize. Of course, you might end up in some, with some um, load imbalance problems because the matrix could be, sorry, could be fat on the top and thin in the bottom, and then you can put in some scheduling to, to fix that. Okay. We don't make a performance model here. We show you how to do that tomorrow. Uh, what we show here now is some performance numbers for typical corner cases on a 24-core AMD node. So this is our node topology. We have two sockets. Each socket has two chips. Each chip has six cores. That was the architecture before Interlagos. So we have four NUMA domains, uh, 24 cores in all. And we choose three different matrices. A large matrix, which is here. This matrix has four million non-zeros. For each non-zero, we have eight bytes for the matrix entry and four bytes at least for the column index. So that's 12 bytes plus the row pointer, which is not important. So 12 bytes, if you multiply this by four million, you get a size which is beyond the L2 L3 cache size on this machine. So this is memory bound. And you see the typical pattern. If you scale across the cores in one chip, you have a typical saturation. You be saturated with five cores. The sixth core is useless. And if we scale on across NUMA domains, we get good scalability. You now know why that is. We get this linear scaling because of the load imbalance incurred by the barrier at the end of the loop. And we get four times the performance when we, do, when we scale out to four NUMA domains. Perfect. This is what we expect from a bandwidth bound code with no additional problems like load and balance on a machine like this. Okay, second case, medium sized matrix. This matrix is half as large, 2.1 million non zeros. And if you multiply this by 12, you see here each, each core has a 512 um, uh, kilobyte level two cache. The aggregated cache on this node is larger than the matrix size, but only if you use all of it. So that means if you only use a single chip, you get the typical saturation behavior again, saturating with five cores. You get good scaling across three NUMA domains, and then as soon as you get the fourth domain, you have a huge speed up. This is called superlinear speed up because the working set fits into the aggregate cache of the four chips. Not with three chips. Three chips are too small, but four chips are sufficient. Of course, that only happens with strong scaling, only if you keep the problem size constant and you increase the number of, uh, increase the resources, then this might happen. It's a corner case. It's nothing you should aim for, so to speak. So it happens uh, from time to time. Okay, that was for an intermediate data set. Now for a very small data set, 17,000 non-zeros. This matrix is so small that it fits into, the, into any cache on this system, into any single level two cache. So each core could hold this matrix easily in its, own, uh, in its own cache. And we see, correspondingly, good performance across the cores of a chip, up to six cores. Yeah. Good scaling, no real bandwidth bottleneck. But then, beyond that, we have a saturation, and then the performance goes down. Now, there could be several reasons for that. Could it be Amdahl's law? Could Amdahl's law play a role? Can Amdahl's law generate this kind of behavior? Amdahl's law means that a certain part of the computation is not parallelizable. So when you put in more resources, you end up with a single core doing all the work, and everybody else yeah, doing some work and then waiting. A typical behavior for Amdahl's law is that you saturate, but you never go down. So if Amdahl's law were the only problem, you wouldn't get this kind of behavior. The same is true for load imbalance. Now, there might be some load imbalance in this problem, but it's not the reason for the breakdown, because if you have load imbalance, you also get saturation behavior. It's, Amda's law is just a variant of load imbalance, if you put it that way. So this is a behavior that only comes because as you put in more resources, you pay more overhead. One example is OpenMP barrier overhead. OpenMP barrier overhead goes up with a number of threads, and this is the only way you can get this behavior. So this is really parallelization overhead, which dominates in this case. Again, a couple of interesting patterns that you see using this relevant kernel. It's not just a streaming 
benchmark kernel anymore, it's really relevant. Okay, conclusions, and then we can get to the break. So if the problem is large, we have badness saturation effects. We have saturating behavior, which is a good thing because you hit a bottleneck. So we have spare cores. We have cores that we can leave idle. And what do we do with, with idle cores? Well, we can just leave them idle and save some power. Papers have been written about that as well, of course, how much power you can save by only scaling up to the bottleneck and then leave the rest of the cores idle. There is some significant savings possible. It's not negligible. You could also use them for other tasks. For example, you could put threads on them that do communication in the background. So that way you could overlap communication and computation. If your program allows for that, you can save a lot of time if you are communication limited by overlapping the communication with the computation. Good thing to put cores to use. And that's more important than saving a couple of watts of power. So the next question is, if performance saturates, can we predict this performance saturation level? Can we predict that it should saturate at two gigaflops here? Or is it some arbitrary value that drops out of some very complicated architecture uh, that we might have? Okay, so this is the, the, the basis of the bandwidth-based performance modeling. And the next lecture that Gerhard will give you is, is all about this. And since we're not dealing with a simple streaming kernel anymore, but with indirect access, so B of col index of J, what's the significance of this indirect access? Can it be modeled? Can I put this, this unknown behavior of the right-hand side access into the model and, and predict it? Okay, very important question. And last, can we predict when it should saturate? Can we predict it should accelerate at two or at four or at five? Also, interesting question. Okay, all these topics will be covered apart probably from, the, from this energy saving and NPI communication, which would like, exceed the, the scope. Okay, that's it. Um, and uh, yeah, we have the break now.